am I, am I attempting to, if you will, argue from an American standpoint? That's really not why I'm here. I was born in the United States. I'm proud to be an American. But that's not, that's not the, the standpoint I'm, I'm taking. And it's really just come out of my lifetime working with the Chinese in a developing country. And the more I've learned about some African countries in the, in the course of teaching the course I now teach, which is called uh, International uh, Investment in Developing Countries, China and Africa, the more I've learned about that, it's, it's caused me to think that there are ways in which some African countries should reorient their relationship. So with that as background, I hope you'll understand what, what, what if you will, the, the spirit of my, of my conversation is. Um, we have at least one person in the audience who will be even more familiar with China than I am, the young lady sitting here from the Chinese embassy, and I welcome her. Um, for her, this will not be news, but I do think that it's important for African leaders and African business people to see clearly, perhaps, what the China model has been so that when we speak quickly about the China model, we don't, we don't misunderstand it. Um, I think what distinguished the Chinese model of attracting foreign investment over the last 40 years was that China set certain basic conditions on anything that a foreign investor would do in China. And the kind of conditions they set, I'm simplifying of course, but in general, was that they wanted the foreign companies to actually be true investors, equity investors, with registered capital for a long period of time in joint ventures. Especially in the first 20 or 30 years, it was unusual to see a wholly foreign-owned uh, venture in China. Almost everything from General Motors to Airbus to many, many companies came in as joint ventures. And the Chinese insisted that the feasibility studies be jointly done and jointly examined by Chinese parties and the foreign parties. And they insisted that in these joint ventures that there would be, um, if you will, co-equal co-managers, vice managers, so that even if the local Chinese person at the time wasn't as well experienced, they would gain the experience from being in that position in the company. This, this encouraged skills transfers, um, and it encouraged the foreign investors to be invested in China to think long term. It's not a criticism of a great infrastructure project to say that the construction company that builds it is not making an investment in your country. You're making the investment. If you pay for a road, you've made an investment for something that will be, and you're, you're on the hook, if you will, for the future. But a construction company is done. They've made a sale. They've sold you the concrete. They've sold you the, the, um, the labor. If they build a power plant and leave it to you and you pay for the power plant, they haven't invested in your country because they're not banking on your country long term. They've made a sale. The Chinese didn't do it that way. They said, if you want to come into China, we want you to put registered capital in and we expect you to stay. Most foreign investors in China found it very awkward politically if they tried to stop a project that they'd started. And uh, this was done uh, with great care. I think the result of all that was several things. The result was that there was a great skills transfer and a great learning that went on. In the short period of time we have, I'm not going to go into all the strengths of China, some of which are different from some African countries. And therefore, the China model may or may not apply to a particular African country, like Tanzania. Um, but the strengths are, among other things, a language which is the same written language back in time for 2,000 years and connects a continent as large as Europe or as large as parts of Africa. An incredible history, less ethnic and religious strife than many countries. Compare India, compare countries in Africa. Um, China doesn't have that kind of issue. It has size. I think, this, I think the Communist Party has been, for China's development, a great strength. It has been a, a uh, source of, of direction. And culturally, culturally, the Chinese have been incredibly interested in learning. Um, there'll be a smile, I think, if I say a phrase in Chinese, and I'm waiting for the smile. 
and I'm going to say five words which my friends over here will recognize immediately. And I'll keep going. Okay. What I just said, showing off slightly, but what I just said was written 2,000 years ago by Confucius. It's the first words of the Analects, the great Confucian work, and the first word in it is Xue, to study, to learn. And my, I was so impressed as an American when I was in China as a young man and afterwards as a businessman, how willing the Chinese are to learn. Now there's something else. In every developing country, government officials have to be incentivized for the growth of the country. They have to see a way in which they and their families will benefit from the wealth of the country. This is not as easy as it sounds, and different countries and different governments and different officials and different cultures have done this in different ways. We all know ways in which that can happen which are fundamentally negative, in which whether it be kickbacks or other payments in secret, non-negotiated deals, different government officials become quite wealthy. Uh, and in some countries, they become wealthy because they can say no to various projects. And the issue with that is that sometimes the projects are uneconomic or the wrong price. Um, in other societies, I think, the way that families of government officials have become very wealthy, and I, I would generalize, and I, I, I'd be willing to actually, by the way, later I would be interested to hear the thoughts from our Chinese colleagues. If you're simplifying and generalizing enormously, I think that the vast majority of families of government officials in China who became very wealthy, became very wealthy because they themselves were very talented and were entrepreneurial and great at connections. But fundamentally, it was from inside information. They knew where the subway system was going ahead of anyone else. They knew where the IPO was going. And they were promoted, the officials themselves, based on GDP performance in their province. What I'm trying to say about that is, if your family and you yourself, if you are promoted based upon GDP, and if your son-in-law or your nephew or your wife will become wealthy from real estate, that grows up, or an IPO of a company, or even consulting in that area, you have an incentive that's completely aligned with the growth of your country economically. And also, the money you are acquiring stays in as an investment, a kind of equity investment. And I think that um, that has been uh, a great strength in China. So, um, uh, the other thing I think that African countries need to think about for China, and then I'll come to, I think, what are the challenges for the African countries, but just staying on China for a second. It's always important when you're watching something and you take a snapshot of it to ask yourself where it's coming from and where it's going. And I think in the last 20 years where China has been is not necessarily where China will be in the next 20 years. And therefore, as a partner, China's capabilities will be different in the next 20 years than they were in the last 20 years. Uh, uh, some of the things that characterized the last 20 years, previous to now, were an enormous body of foreign exchange, $3 trillion of foreign exchange that was available for all sorts of projects around the world. And uh, what was also, and, and uh, we also, the result of that, the Sovereign Wealth Fund and so forth, um, and very fast growth, and basically fairly positive demographics. China, the next 20 years, is facing some great challenges. And, and the Chinese, one of the other things I respect about the Chinese is they're very clear-eyed about their challenges, and they often themselves state them very clearly. Demographically, uh, China has a huge issue because of the one-child policy, a huge issue with dropping uh, overall labor, um, uh, the number of people in the labor pool, compared to the number of people of older and retiring. Uh, you often have a situation where it's four to one. You have four grandparents and two parents and one child. 
when that pyramid ages, that is a very different demographic than, let's say, in Tanzania. Very different demographic, and it causes some huge problems. Also, to a large extent, the, the investment in the Chinese economy, if you think of a Chinese economy as consumption plus investment plus net exports, the amount of the China GDP every year that was investments was a huge number compared to most countries. And that has done remarkable things for China. But the Chinese leaders themselves, 10 years ago, said it's too much investment. It's, it's out of balance. A uh, Chinese premier famously said the Chinese economy was unbalanced. They recognized it themselves. But when the global financial crisis came, and in recent years as things have slowed down, I think there's a wide um, uh, consensus that a huge amount of money was pushed out into the economy by state-owned banks to state-owned enterprises and probably spent on overcapacity. So the China of today, compared to the China of 15 years ago, is a China where there's a much more serious issue of debt slowing down the growth. There's demographic issues slowing down the growth. Um, and there's overcapacity. So, of course, that feeds into the brilliance of the BRI, the Belt and Road Initiative. It makes a lot of sense. If you have overcapacity, if your economy is slowing, and of course it makes geopolitical sense, and everyone in this room doesn't need me to go through why that is a brilliant idea on many, on many, on many fronts. In Europe, state-owned enterprises in the 40s, 50s, 60s, and in Africa, state-owned enterprises like state oil companies, state minerals, were characterized usually by the enterprise being a monopoly in its own jurisdiction with no competition within that country. Uh, and all the problems, and, and, and the monopoly operating primarily within that country. And all the problems, the classic problems that that arises, conflicts, inefficiency, lack of competition, corruption, all of that, lack of transparency, lack of accountability, all, and that was true in Europe as well, all of those are characteristics in countries where the state-owned enterprise is a monopoly and doesn't have competition. What China invented, which was such an amazing idea, was they said, we have all these provincial steel companies or power companies or, or telecoms companies. They can't be national champions scattered around like that. We will coalesce them into large companies, but here's what we'll do. Instead of one state-owned telecoms company, there will be three. Instead of one major uh, oil company, there will be three. First of all, by having three of them, they can compete. So you have the benefits of competition. Now we will offer to the public 25 or 30 percent of those companies on the New York Stock Exchange or the Hong Kong Stock Exchange. And as a result of that, they're forced to file prospectuses. They file quarterly reports, annual reports, and any um, inside transaction they have to make public. Uh, and therefore, and they have a price in the stock exchange, let's say all three of them. So you sit back and you have three companies which are state-owned 70%, each of them, but they're competing with each other, like MAD, by the way. They very much compete with each other. They have to report to the world their finances, all audited, excuse me, and um, there's a way of pricing them. So you have all the benefits of competition and market forces, and you still have the benefit, if you will, from the Communist Party standpoint, of ultimate control in some circumstances of these companies. So I just mentioned that um, as an important, this is, this is if you will, state-owned, state capitalism with Chinese characteristics. This is a special way of doing it. And my fear for some African countries is they might say, oh, that's great, we'll just have a national oil company. But that's missing the point of how the Chinese did it, and they did it in that special way. I'm jumping around a little bit to throw out things that maybe I'll be questioned about later. Let me, let me move to Africa and say what my, what my concern is. Um, First of all, you know, the Chinese contributions to Africa are very great, and I think very far-sighted. And um, there's no criticism of that here, per se. But in the Belt and Road Initiative, there is a kind of, there has been a kind of what you might call a typical pattern. 
at least up to now. And it's changing. And by the way, the Chinese themselves are changing. They've made announcements about trying to modify how they do things in the Belt and Road. They've made um, announcements about, thank you very much, about debt sustainability. Uh, just last spring, the Chinese have looked at debt sustainability in a very sensible way. But, so I'm wondering, what I'm going to describe to some degree may not be the way it happens in the future, but I think it's important to understand. In a way, the typical pattern of some of these very large projects has been that there would be high-level talks with government officials in an African country. The, the Chinese side would sort of present a package. It would be sort of a diplomatic construction, labor, bank package. Usually there would be no public bidding. And often it would be the, 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 the loan would be guaranteed by the government, by the, by the African government, ultimately to be paid back by the people of the country. It has turned out that at least some of those projects, and I say at least some, that this is the point, this is not a general issue, but it's an issue in some of the projects because of how they were negotiated. It seems that in retrospect, most people would agree either that the project may not have made economic sense for that country, or it may have been overpriced, uh, or the country may not be able to sustain the debt burden that's taken up. One example is the Malaysian rail project where, and I'm simplifying a little bit, and there may be nuances we don't understand, but an earlier government in Malaysia about five or six years ago agreed with the Chinese government parties to build a rail line down the east coast of Malaysia, and the price announced was $11 billion, or something like $11 billion. Don't hold me to the exact number. In his book, he says, who is afraid of China? And the challenge to Chinese soft to power or something. And there's an African scholar, I think, Obiara. I can tell he's Nigerian by, just by his name. He also has a who is afraid of China, and then he provides like African perspective, civil society perspective on how to engage China. But that's what do we grasp from these titles? Who is afraid of China? Uh, and I want to challenge: Should Africans be afraid of China? In another quotation, he said, uh, "The Chinese model is like is like crossing the river by testing the by feeling the stones." They're feeling the stones, you know. So it's, it's not a, like a new, uh, the universal approach where you have uh, sort of like universal principles on like this is yeah, is, is, is a model which is still in transition. That's why you were saying 20 years from now, China will be different. Things, things, uh, and uh, I'm very glad that you mentioned the example of of, China, of of Kenya. What is happening in Kenya? Because I was reading an article by a Kenyan writer no, uh, called David Ndi. Didi? Didi? Is it Didi? And he was talking about uh, uh, during the BRI uh, summit in Beijing, it was last year. So the Kenyan leadership went to, to Beijing uh, looking for funds from China to finance the second uh, phase of the project, uh, the railway line from Mombasa to. And it, the, the, the Chinese were ready to give the money because apparently things have changed already. A few weeks before that summit, uh, they issued uh, uh, is it a policy that you talk about, the framework, sustainability, yes. debt sustainability framework of the countries in the Belt and Road initiatives, which changed the, the terms of, uh, uh, of financing, the Chinese financing, basically saying uh, the days of checkbook diplomacy for China uh, are over. You know, they don't just give out money. And they demanded that they, they want to see whether the project is economically. Uh, and, and also, you also talked about, uh, but this is something I think the Chinese are also learning along the way. They're making a lot of mistakes, but um, uh, there are signs of that they're also learning. For example, the, the Kenyan example that we gave, now they're saying, no, you're not giving, you're not financing this project unless you tell us whether it's, it has any economic benefits. So this is like someone who is learning along the process. So who should you blame? So people are questioning, what is the African agents in framing these relations between China, China and Africa? And uh, most people say, ah, oh, the African countries are too weak. 
uh, the money. So it's a uh, uh, and maybe you will share with us uh, during the Q&A session if this is a similar trend that the Western world went through, what we see with China today. We have to be grateful and also thankful to you. We are in the years a long-standing relationship with uh, you know, our department for quite some time now. Uh, you know, uh, since he was here a little bit and also shifted to China uh, working with uh, NYU. So we are grateful for this opportunity, Mohammed, you know, bringing all over, you know, away from China, uh, uh, Professor Stephen Hadda, and also having an opportunity to share with her, you know, uh, on uh, Dr. Shangwe, um, um, uh, today. So maybe we don't promise that we'll have uh, you know, another series of <laughs> public lecture, you know, this nature, but we really appreciate, uh, you know, Stephen, for your time and also for sharing with us, you know, this extensive knowledge, which actually enabled us to learn a lot of things, you know. And also, I think you benefited also from comments from members of the floor, you know, some kind of questions. Can I ask you like. all applaud Dr. Senga for helping us? <laughs> yeah. So thank you very much, guys, for uh, you know your time, and I uh, hope uh, we meet again. Thank you very much.